Hello and welcome to BSG webinars, everyone. My name is Dan Carney, Graphic Design Manager at BSG. Thanks for joining us on our 22nd webinar. We have a great show today, but first there's just a couple things that I need to get to. If you're joining us for the first time or have only seen a few BSG webinars, we have a lot of great content and past webinars on our YouTube channel. So be sure to look us up and subscribe on at BSG Craft where you'll find them all. Also, be sure to check back soon for more webinars. Those are always located at bsgcraftbrewing.com and clicking on the webinars tile on our homepage. As the holidays approach, we're working on some great webinars to ring in the new year, so stay tuned. We announced upcoming webinars in our newsletter and all of our social media channels, so follow us there if you haven't already. Now, before I introduce today's guests, I'd like to add that as we talk and sample these wonderful Belgian beers, in respect to the fine breweries that make them, we'll not be divulging any distinct recipe information. Also, we ask that when you ask questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, that they're kept to malt focused questions and to please avoid asking any that are about hops and yeast so we can get through this in a timely manner. But we really do encourage that you ask many questions as possible. For the second week in a row, we'll be giving away a BSG swag pack to one lucky winner that asks the best question. And as a special treat, I'm told that there may be some West Blatteran, courtesy of our friends from Dingamans in that box. So please ask away. And now for the moment I've been waiting for today's presentation, a virtual tasting journey with Carl Dingamans, traditional Belgian beers and the malt that makes them. I'd like to welcome Carl Dingamans and Giovanni Christis all the way over in Belgium and BSG's Belgian beer obsessive, Ben Mosshart, AKA DJ Whitewheat. Hi, Ben. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Doing well, very excited about this uh, webinar. Should be awesome. It'll be great. I'm, I'm ready to start sampling some beer. Yeah, Belgian beer is actually a big passion of mine. I, uh, my first aha beer, and uh, I'd have to say that four out of the five Desert Island beers for me are Belgian beers. So it's pretty awesome to be included in here. Yep. Well, we're just waiting for Carl and Giovanni to jump on here. And there they are. Hi, Carl. Hi, Hi Giovanni. Hi, hello. Hi. Hi, How Dan. Hi, Ben. How are you? Doing well, thank well. you. Okay. Um, I'm Carl Digamans, fifth generation of uh, Molses in our family. Uh, I'd like to welcome all uh, participants to this uh, webinar. And um, yeah, I've been uh, at the Malt House for uh, 25 years now, uh, studied in Ghent, did um, uh, some uh, apprenticeship everywhere around in Belgium, and uh, I've been uh, mostly in production quality and the last years mostly on sales. So uh, we have been working together here with Giovanni, he's next to me. and. Um, Giovanni? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Giovanni, the craft marketing coordinator of Dingemans Maltings in Belgium. Uh, besides Dingemans, I also am a brewer. I have my own beer brands and I brew at the local craft beer uh, brewery in Antwerp. Well, thanks and welcome, guys. Uh, before we get started on the beers, I'd like to play a little video for the audience. So let's roll that. And we'll be back on to talk about Belgian beers and the malt that makes them right after this.
All right. Let's welcome you guys back. And then we can get started. So I hope everyone has their beers and questions ready. Uh, let's get to it. So Ben, if you would like to introduce our first beer, please. Absolutely. Giovanni will have you share your presentation. All yes. right. So the first beer that we actually have, uh, while well, we're waiting for the presentation to kick in, is St. Bernardus Wit. Um, this is a great representation of the style. It's actually brewed in collaboration with Pierre Sellis, who, in my opinion, is the godfather of Belgian wit beer, having saved it in the 1950s from near extinction. Um, it's most notably uh, known for its flavors of clove, uh, coriander, and orange zest. But I believe that the malt profile is extremely overlooked and also essential to brewing a classic Belgian wit beer. Uh, one thing I want to note too that I think is really important is that Dingemann's Pilsner is extremely light and delicate. And I think it also uh, creates an awesome canvas for the yeast and all the other ingredients to kind of pop and do their thing. And um, it creates a very, very balanced product as a base malt. So, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Carl. He can begin to break down the malt analysis and whatnot. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Cheers. It's uh, one of my favorite beers in, in summer. Uh, let's all think back a little bit on, on this hot summer from this year. And uh, with one of the favorite beers, uh, Belgian white, with, uh, which is very refreshing. Um, about the production of the, the malt process. So uh, we at Dingemans, we select our barley uh, very uh, severely. So we have uh, like uh, 30, 40 suppliers, uh, mostly based in, in France, because most of our barley comes from France. Um, of course, we do um, unloading the barley here at our silos, uh, all checking all different parameters like uh, protein, like moisture, like uh, a whole bunch of, of parameters, uh, also some, uh, some toxins we check, germination, of course, and, um, and, and water sensibility is also one of my, one of uh, very important parameters there. Um, with this first malt type, I'm gonna shortly explain uh, very briefly our process, of course, and um, because this, these different steps we will need along the evening, or sorry, along the day for you guys. Um, we, we start, of course, uh, when the barley is discharged and it's been well checked, we start the production. We will uh, firstly do the steeping, uh, depending on, on different um, or varieties, or uh, if it's barley or if it's wheat, we will change the, the steeping program, of course. Uh, mostly we are steeping uh, around 30 to 34, five hours. And uh, we see, of course, also that when we, uh, when we have other varieties, uh, it might be that we go only to 25 or 28 hours. And we play around, of course, also with the, the dry and the wet phases during steeping. Um, if we go further, uh, we, when, it's, when it's steeped, we go to germination. Uh, you, you all should know that we have a very traditional malt house. Um, and I mean with that, that we are still using the traditional timings. And therefore, I want to say that uh, the, the big uh, uh, commercial monsters, they mostly uh, limit the time of germination. But here at Dingemans, we are still germinating five, five and a half, sometimes six days. Um, after germination, we go to the kiln, where we follow different steps to different temperatures. And uh, I'm sorry, I have a list here with all the Fahrenheit. Um, and on the transfer to, from Celsius to Fahrenheit. So we go to fastly to, uh, after, after at the end of the kilning, we go up to 160 Fahrenheit, 170 Fahrenheit, depending on which malt we are producing. If we go then to the, to the malt analysis, you will see on the malt analysis, you will see that uh, I've here put the two main malts that can be used in this style of beer. Um, we, are, we are talking about the wheat malt, of course, and the Pilsen. Um, for firstly, uh, to highlight the Pilsen uh, malt, uh, what, what is so uh, unique or what is so um, special from our malt, we uh, 
although it is well modified, we see that on the viscosity, for example, we see that also on, um, on the beta glucans, which are not on the list, but we, are, we tend to use malts that are low in viscosity, low in beta glucans, and uh, although they are low in soluble uh, proteins. So we, we try to do the, the modification of the malt, uh, the physical modification, we try to tend it as good as well as, as, as it gets, and that it has no problems in your lottering tongue, if you use a, a classic lottering tongue, and then the soluble proteins, not to force it too much. Why do we do that? Because, well, for example, in this style of beer, we want uh, the color to be as low as possible. So we really tend to, below, to stay below five and a half, six uh, EBC in Love Bond, uh, 2.5, 2.7 boiling color is, is for us uh, important to stay underneath that value. If you then compare a Pilsen analysis with a wheat uh, analysis, you will see on the bottom, you see a, a big difference, which is, is clearly due to the wheat. The, the viscosity of the wheat is much higher. We have here an example of analysis at 1.94. 1, 1. Uh, um, and it's, it can go also up to 2 or 2.1. Uh, what, what else do we see that on the soluble protein is around the same level as the Pilsen? Uh, the same reason here, we also want our wit beer because it's, it's uh, the style Belgian wit is really very blonde, very, very uh, low in color. We want that boiling color to be as low as possible. Um, what do we see? El what else do we see? That extract difference. Wheat, wheat um, malt always give a much higher extract than Pilsen uh, or than barley. Um, um, yeah, that's about the, the biggest differences and the main issues why we are supplying. And we will say that with all the slides, uh, if you see the, the, um, the beers we are, uh, we are having here as an example, we are all proud and in, in, uh, we from Dingemans are proud to be part of all these uh, great Belgian wheat beers. And it's time for a short drink in between. And I give the word to Giovanni to talk about a little bit about the taste of these fine beers. Yeah, so if you see your glass before you, you see that um, it pours very cloudy, cloudy uh, with a small thin, um, thin white head. Uh, the cloudy color of the beer, it comes from the wheat malt. So um, it has some slightly haziness into it. It's not really hazy like, like IPAs, but if you see it, um, you can see through it, but, but not very clear. Um, in the smell, if you smell through it, uh, there are some spices like uh, pepper, citrus, uh, coriander, uh, also some uh, ripe fruits like uh, banana or uh, mango. Uh, that's a typical smell of uh, Belgian white ales. Uh, it's due to the, the use of the typical yeast. Um, also, you can smell some little sourness also from uh, from the wheat malt. Then if you taste it, beer has an, uh, an average body. Uh, it's medium sweet, uh, mildly bitterness come from, uh, from, the, from the hops. Um, there's also lots of banana uh, from the specific uh, yeast they, uh, they use in the beer. Um, you also taste some lemon zest, um, again, the coriander, you smelled it before, now you taste the coriander also. Um, some grains and a high malty character of the wheat malt. Um, famous Belgian breweries that have whites in their uh, assortment are this, the one we are trying now is the St. Bernardus. Uh, also Vedette from uh, Mortiat as an, uh, a white ale. Uh, you have the Bronze of Bruxelles. Uh, Blanche de Namur and uh, the Blanche de Bruges. Yeah, that's also a famous one. Wow. All right. Well, if we uh, have any questions on either uh, Belgian white ales or the malt used in them, uh, feel free to ask them now. Uh, we'll encourage you to ask the questions even during uh, each beer's presentation. So um, otherwise, 
I don't have any questions right now, so we can move on to our next beer if we'd like to. All right. Yeah. So next up we have Dupont Saison, and uh, this is actually one of my favorite beers. Um, it is one of my st favorite styles to produce, and I happen to think that Dupont is essentially the, the benchmark to most folks who get into Saisons. You know, everyone's probably had uh, a, a couple different beers from them, a Beckley Bambou for the winter time. It's amazing. Um, this particular beer is pretty interesting because it, they say it on their website, so I will discuss it, but they typically uh, brew this with 100% Pilsner malt, and that's kind of counterintuitive to a lot of what I think the American brewers think when they pour this beer because of the color. But one thing to point out in particular with it is that uh, they, as well as a lot of other Belgian breweries, have direct fire systems and also believe that a uh, long boil is essential to creating more mouthfeel through the caramelization of the wort. So um, I am really excited to have Giovanni and Carl on to kind of talk about this more because uh, I think everybody here has a, a recipe that they've definitely played with that includes a lot of adjuncts. But when it comes down to uh, the OG, in my opinion, which is DuPont, um, they brew it classic just with Pilsner. So uh, Carl, if you want to take it away, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yes, indeed. Um, we were not going to discuss um, recipes of, of individual breweries. Um, some of them are using uh, Pilsen malt. Some of them are using uh, paleo malt. Or, and, adds, and um, a lot of them are, are adding some rye in, in their saison as well uh, to get that nice uh, herby taste, to get that nice dryness of the, of the saison, which, which they are famous for as well. Um, we can say, and, and, and which we could also say in the, in the beer before on the Belgian wit, but here as well, um, we're proud to say that most of these breweries we see here are using 100% Dingham and Smalt in these beers. So uh, Dupont, I'm not going to say names, but they're, most of them are using 100% Dingham and um, what, what do we see as, as malts that we can highlight here? We already highlighted the Pilsen in the, in the, with the beer before, but one of the beers which are pretty, one of the malts which are pretty interesting is the, the Pale Ale malt. Um, if, we go, if we go to the next slide, you will see that um, how is our pale ale produced? This is produced um, a traditional uh, method with um, the steeping germination. And at the end of the germination, we are going a little bit higher in temperatures. When we are for the Pilsen malt, we stay around 60 uh, Fahrenheit, 60 to maybe 64, 66, something like that. For the pale ale malt, we can go up to uh, 72, 75 Fahrenheit to, to uh, have at the end of the germination. In the beginning, we will, start, we will start on a lower temperature. We will certainly start again between 60 and 64. Why do we do that? Because this is the, really the best temperature to start and have your proteolytic modification. So we need a lot of um, soluble uh, protein because we want the Maillard reaction, of course, to be, to be possible um, on the kiln to create this color. And then uh, at the end, uh, the last day or maybe the last two days, we can easily go up to uh, 72 or maybe 75 uh, Fahrenheit. And then after this intense germination, you can say, we are going to kiln it uh, starting at low temperature because we really want to, to, to keep the enzymes we produced during the germination. We really want those enzymes to stay. And... Um, but we, we can go up at the end, we can go uh, around 200 Fahrenheit uh, easily uh, to achieve this color. Uh, our pale ale malt has uh, normally a color of around uh, 3.8 to 4 uh, Lovibond. And, and this uh, easily gives you a, a 5 to 5.5 five uh, boiling color. Uh, what else do we see that we really, the pale ale you, we are producing uh, can be used in 100% of your grain bill. So we really want the viscosity to be as low as possible, as well as the beta glucans, and uh, that this malt shouldn't give you any problem in your laundry time. Um, the second malt I would like to highlight here, and uh, I see Dan is tasting, so I'll, I'll grab a beer myself. 
Cheers. The second, cheers. The second um, malt we, we can highlight here is our rye malt. And uh, to be honest with you, we used to produce rye uh, about 30 years ago. We, we produced it quite a lot. Then we had some setback with, uh, with the production of the rye. We had some less, less uh, demand for it. So it, it disappeared in our portfolio during a few years. Uh, but then 15 years ago, we restarted producing it more and more. And we, we mainly focused the rye malt, which is the big problem with the rye malt, is of course the wort viscosity, which all brewmasters know. You see it here, when you see it here, uh, black on white, if you say it like that, uh, if you go from pale ale to 1.53 and you go to a uh, viscosity on this typical malt uh, rye analysis at 4.7, uh, yeah, you know that with a classic lottering ton, when you exceed 10% of, uh, of your grain bill, you are asking for, uh, you might have some problems. So that's the point when, when we, when we um, created or restarted doing this uh, our rye malt. Uh, 15 years ago, we really wanted to focus that this viscosity should be as low as possible. And what do we do again for that? You have to know that uh, rye has no husk, as also the wheat, but rye is really absorbing very easily the water during steeping. So if we have a normal steep for, let's say, like I explained, 25, 30, 35 hours for wheat or, uh, or barley, for rye, we are only steeping four, six, seven hours, something like that. Very, very short, only one wet phase. And then when we pump it over to the germination box, there we will spray as much water as we can to achieve at the, on the first day uh, easily the, the 40 or 45% moisture. Um, by doing this, we are really uh, achieving a good modification. Uh, of of uh, of the rye, and we see that uh, you see that also on the on the callback index, for example, the callbacks index is uh, around fifty seven, and uh, extracts and uh, different fine cores are also pretty good. Um, what else could we say on the on the production of of ale and the rye? For the rest, um, the most of the points I think I highlighted here. And uh, then we go further to, uh, to Giovanni uh, that he can have a taste. Cheers. So, Saison, uh, the color is much more golden than, uh, than the white beers. It's also very clear. There's a lot of carbonation um, in it as well. Um, the, the aroma, the smell is very floral. Uh, some fruit notes like pears, uh, apples, also some bananas. Bananas, the banana aroma in, in Belgian beer is really typical. Um, we have a lot of beer styles with a typical banana smell and the wheat beer season. Also some Belgian triples. Uh, they taste and uh, smell like, like bananas. It's, it's because of the use of the typical Belgian uh, yeast. Um, also in the smell, it's all coriander, some peppery spices. I also noticed some hay and, um, and horse blanket, some funkiness. Um, if you taste it, it's nice malty. You get a nice malty taste with a medium body, a very smooth mouthfeel, a lot of bitterness. Most of the saisons are, um, have a lot of IBU. Um, also a bit of a small sour taste and um, some hints of lemon, uh, sweet spices, and again, so a touch of hay. Um, some famous breweries that have um, Saison in their, uh, in their range are, of course, Dupont, as mentioned before, uh, also uh, Brewery de Ranke with their uh, Saison de Totigny, uh, the Saison uh, saint fillon is also another uh, example and uh, the Saison Super 8 from uh, Brewery Hart. Good. All right. Well, we've had a couple questions come through. Um, 
There's one one I'm going to skip over real quick because I kind of have two of them that sort of line up with each other. Um, one of them that was asked is, is a decoction done to any of the saisons? And then the other question was, do you know the mashing process for DuPont? Single step decoction. So um, that's why I kind of put those two together. But can I test my knowledge on Belgian beer here? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, from my understanding, when I was over there and was talking to a few breweries, um, they believe in doing a lot of step mashing. And uh, I'm not going to call it anyone in particular because we're going to keep that uh, private. But um, what I was told is that multiple steps create uh, immense characteristics throughout the um, finished product. I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, you end up finding more depth and flavor if you can continue to uh, modify the mash as you can as you move forward. So um, typically you'll see up to three to four different rests as you move through the mashing process. Uh, decoction doesn't seem to be as big of a discussion over there, um, but some people do focus on turbid, but that's more of uh, lambic breweries who do that because they use a lot of unmalted grain. Am I correct there, Giovanni and uh, Carl? <laughs> Who, who's the Belgian guy in this, uh, this uh, <laughs> discussion here? Oh. <laughs> no, you're, you're right. You're right. Really right. Yeah. We have, you see steps around uh, breweries uh, uh, waiting at uh, 52, 63, uh, going up to 74. Uh, this is something which is very regularly done. Uh, decoction really not. Uh, I can't recall of uh, any brewery doing uh, decoction. Giovanni, you, you might know, but but no, not of my knowledge. Most of them do really uh, different steps. Uh, you might have some who do uh, a single step uh, immediately at at uh, sixty four. Yeah, I think. yeah. But but most of the brewers do do different steps. Yeah, sure. So that's right. Celsius for everybody. And then the other thing too is that I think like it's, it's pretty cat like normal if it's an hour and a half to at least over two hour boil on a lot of these beers. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it used to be. Uh, I have to say that more and more also Belgian breweries are looking more and more to to energy and then and, and to uh, sustainability and as well. So so there are projects with, with uh, different breweries to reduce, or try to reduce uh, this boiling time as much as possible, but but an hour, an hour and a half is is uh, used a lot, for sure. Well, excellent. Uh, let's keep moving. So I've got one question here that asks: When you talk about the wort viscosity, and with pale, you want it low for easy laudering. How much can you influence the viscosity, or what would the range be for pale? Um, you know, in, in between different uh, deliveries, I supply. I, I, I suppose uh, this brewmaster is is wondering. Um, let's say that we could go in between 1.48 up to 1.58. Normal normal supplies from our pale ale malt should be in between these numbers. It's um, it's it depends, of course, on the on the harvest. And on the quality of the barley, it can it can vary a little bit every year, and it, it will also vary in between deliveries because different batches and, and all of this. But uh, in between 1.48 and 1.58, we should really be all the time. All right. Um, and then let's get to two more quick, and then we're going to move on to our next style. Um, but we're asked: Do Belgian brewers add rice husks? to facilitate laudering when using rye malt? Um, the one who are using a laudering ton, yes, yes. Uh, depends on the, on the percentage. Uh, if they only use five or 10%, some of them might not do it. But if we exceed that, uh, I'm, I'm convinced they do. Um, we also have a very typical uh, customer in, in, in Holland who's, who, who is brewing up to 100% rye beer, um, but his, 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 uh, his brew house is equipped with a Mura filter, so, so this is no issue at, at this time, but rice husks are used quite often in, in brew houses. Yeah. All right, so for our last question in the Saison section, um, we have 
How do you balance getting a dry finish typical to many Belgian styles with multiple mash steps while maintaining some unfermentables for head retention? That's a difficult one. That's uh, almost a question for a brewmaster. Uh, <laughs> let's say, um, I think that the here is more influenced uh, by the yeast and by how the brewmaster is, is, um, is working on his, his uh, yeast temperature and his fermentation temperature and uh, that he influences this, um, this, this um, sweetness or this, this uh, full bodiness like this brewmaster is, is uh, explaining more by playing with his temperatures and with the type of yeast that he's using. I concur. All right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> cheers Thanks, to today's Dons. A cheers. Great style of mine as well. So, all right. Well, let's move on to our next beer style. We got the Flanders Red. So, this style was uh, created, I guess, or became known around roughly the 1850s. Um, it was produced originally in West Flanders. And the interesting thing about this beer is that it is conditioned for a long period, up to 18 months in cask, uh, fooder, or barrel, depending on who's using it. Also, depending on who's producing it and which uh, beer they're producing, um, it can be anywhere from eight to 18 months in barrel. But uh, the secondary fermentations with a uh, lactic acid blend of bacteria. Um, typically you don't see Brett too much in these beers, but uh, they do have a, a significant and not a ton, but a light, light portion of uh, specialty malts added to it uh, to kind of add to some of that more in-depth, darker flavor, a um, little roastiness. And uh, the finish is, which actually I'll let, I'll let Giovanni talk about that. <laughs> Sorry, step into your turf there, but uh, I'll go ahead and pass it to Carl. He can discuss uh, what's to be expected, which malts and what not to use for producing the style. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ben. Up to now, I follow you completely, but to say that there is not so many specialty malts in this uh, beer, I have to correct you. There is quite some of it in, the, in these beers. Uh, it's not all uh, very, very dark uh, malts they are using, but they are, they are using quite some specialty malts. Um, most of them are using um, some pale ale, the, the one the type we discussed before, uh, but also Munich and the, the malt we are going to highlight here is our aromatic malt um, because these three malts are quite often used in, in, uh, in these beers. Some of them um, prefer also to add some, some, uh, some Cara uh, types like the Cara 45 um, to get a little bit more readiness uh, in, in, the, in the beer. Um, of these, of these breweries, um, yeah, we, we can shortly, of course, you all know Rodenbach, um, but, but uh, the two or the three beer other are mainly family owned uh, breweries since we are a family owned maltings. Um, yeah, for example, Duchesse de Bourgogne is, is a, a real family uh, owned brewery as well with, with two brothers and one sister who are just uh, working daily in the in the brewery, one of the brothers is, is, is brewing every day. Uh, and, and up to, just a small story about them, uh, up to last year, they, uh, they really um, built up a new brew house for them. And Peter, the, the brother, Peter Verhagen, um, he used to be struggling up to last year with bags of 50 kilos uh, pouring up to, this, to, this, uh, to his mill. So, uh, back to the malt types, um, aromatic malts and, and pale ale and Munich are often used in, in, this, um, in this Flanders red ale. Um, to talk about a bit, bit more about the aromatic, what is so typical on, on this aromatic malt, which will be, it's produced uh, on the kiln. Uh, so pale ale, Munich and aromatic are produced on the kiln. We uh, typically do, of course, steeping, intensive steeping for the aromatic malt. Uh, what do we mean with that? We could exceed the 35 hours, 35, 38 hours, depending on the crop, depending on the water sensibility of the barley. We will really intensely go with a high moisture content up to the germination box. 
and then it, it's following uh, normal, um, typically a normal germination uh, schedule at the same temperatures as with the pale ale. Only the big difference here is that the last 30 to 34 hours, we will switch off the fan of the germination box. And what is happening at that time, uh, we get a lot of buildup of CO2. We, go, we get the temperature in the layer going up to, to temperatures of, sorry, I have to check again, 122 to 140 Fahrenheit, something in that, in that range. So very high in the germination box. A lot of people think then that uh, this is really a problem, but actually it's, it's not a problem. We are going to stew the, the germination. Um, for people who are not really common in maltings, uh, if you have this, for example, in the beginning of your germination process, you have a big problem because in the beginning of the process, the germ will be killed and afterwards will no longer germinate. So we really only do it the last 30, 35 hours of the germination process. So actually, we already are getting a little bit of liquidification. We are getting some, uh, some enzymatic uh, activity of alpha and beta amylases a little bit. And we see if we take the kernels just before when it's going to the kiln and we press on the kernels, you see already some liquidification inside. With this, with this 50, uh, with this, I'm sorry, with this 140, 120, 140 Fahrenheit, uh, it goes hot to the kiln. And there it's been killed off uh, up to 210, 220 Fahrenheit at the end. So again, we start very slowly. We start only at 120 Fahrenheit and go slightly up with, with small steps, 140, 160, 180, and then to finish around 210, 220 Fahrenheit. Uh, a very intense malt, uh, a very uh, uh, cookie-like flavor. We see if you, we take the analysis, we see due to this stewing, uh, we, we create some, some, lacto, uh, some lactic uh, acid, we create some activity of uh, uh, lactic bacteria, and we see that the pH is going down. When we have a Pilsen malt of uh, pH around 6, 6.1, 6 uh, we see with these malts that pH goes down to 5.4, sometimes even 5.2. Um, this malt is typically produced on our smaller kilns. So we have um, three different uh, malt houses here in, in, uh, in Stavrook. We have only one site. Uh, this is only in, in, in Stavrook in Belgium. And we have three different lines. And this malt is mostly produced in uh, the line where we have two smaller kilns. Uh, so what is the advantage of this? Uh, because we have two kilns of 20, 25 tons. Um, because the, the, the color of a, an aromatic malt is never uh, right on the 20 long malt. You might have one of, of, of 18 or one of 22 or 25. And, and that's why we uh, produce it on the smaller kilns. So we afterwards, we can, we can uh, blend. Uh, of course, we don't blend uh, white and black, but we blend in certain uh, limits. And we can go on this range of uh, 20, 20 lovely bonds. Um, it, this whole explanation makes me a little bit thirsty. So it's back to uh, Giovanni to, uh, to further explain on this uh, Flanders red ale. Very nice beer to be having uh, on the sea coast in, uh, in Ostend, for example, or in uh, Knokke uh, in Belgium. You might drink uh, a Rodenbach and you get some uh, North Sea shrimps with it which is one of uh, the favorite uh, things to do when you have been uh, walking around and uh, drinking some nice beer. Yeah, so the, the typical taste of um, a Flanders red ale. So we start with the scene. So it's clearly uh, a clear, dark red, brownish color with a small, thin white head. Um, the lovely color is uh, due to the use of the caramel and the aromatic malt. Um, if you smell beer, it smells very nice. You get a fruity, sour aroma uh, with a lot of cherries, some apples, also um, some almonds. 
and also some uh, some funkiness, some funkiness like um, balsamic vinegar uh, yeah. and some woody notes. Then if you try it, you get this um, fruity, sweety, uh, sweet malt notes. Uh, also uh, a very sour taste of uh, tart cherries, some strawberries, uh, other dark ripe fruits like plums, uh, some berries, blueberry, blackberry, something like that, and uh, and a very subtle bitterness. You you don't you don't taste hops not at all. Um, again, in the taste you also have the small uh, some notes of the balsamic vinegar. This comes from uh, the use of uh, of the fooders uh, to ripe these beers, um, and you have a, a long mostly sour aftertaste uh, with, again, some ripe cherries and, uh, and almonds. Well, as Carol already mentioned before, so some famous breweries who have uh, a Flanders retail in their uh, assortment are Rodenbach, of course, uh, Duchesse de Bourgogne, Bourgogne de Flandre, um, Brewery de Brabandre has their uh, Petrus uh, range, and uh, Cuvée de Jacobin is also a, a famous Flanders red ale. It's a great beer. It is a great yeah. beer. Yeah. So one question that we have, and I know you kind of touched on this, uh, Giovanni, but for darker styles, achieve color from caramel slash roasted malts or sugars, or is it both? Um, as of my experience, they are hardly using any roasted malts. So there is really, the color is really coming from the malts, but not from roasted malts. It's more coming from, as mentioned before, uh, Pale Ale, Munich as a, as a um, base malt and then adding different other malts, like for example, the aromatic or also some Cara 45, even some of them use, but not, not a lot of them might use some special B, but most of them uh, go with this aromatic malt in combination with ale and, and, uh, and mute. All right, well, I will cheers to the red Flanders. This is one of my favorite Belgian styles, so. Cheers to you. Yeah. But to keep things moving, we need to move on to our next beer style, which we have a couple of them in this category. Um, we also have some questions that had already come through early on. So Ben, oh, okay. I will let you uh, introduce our first of the three that we have to go through. Um, and you can go ahead and introduce it. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, to be able to sport the uh, Trappist, uh, authentic Trappist product mark, you got to kind of follow a few strict guidelines. Uh, beer has to be produced within the monastery walls, meaning that you can't contract it uh, elsewhere. Um, the second thing is that beer comes of secondary importance. So the monastic way of life is the focus. Uh, it's not a brewery. With a monastery, it's a monastery that has a brewery um, within the grounds. And the third thing is that it shouldn't be for profit, uh, but the money made should go to maintaining the monastic way of life and also supporting the local community. And uh, there are a few different styles that they produce, which we've categorized as um, ankle, which is, uh, I, I think my pronunciation is terrible, but single, uh, double, triple, and quad. And um, each has its significant importance historically. And uh, it's a lot of fun because everybody's got their own interpretation. Um, typically they are labeled as numbers or just as is like Orval, uh, but we've got quite a few to go through today. We're gonna start with Orval. We're gonna go to Road for 10 and we're gonna finish with the Chimay Grand Reserve. So I'll go ahead and let Carl take it away. Yeah, thanks Ben. Um, the, they, it's correct, like you say, they are, there's one one other issue to, to mention maybe, or issue not, but what they are also giving a lot to charity. So they're also, uh, 
sustaining uh, the community and also, of course, the, the Abbey, but they also give a lot of, they also give it also a lot of money to charity, to good works, um, not only in Belgium, but also in, in, in Africa or in different, in different locations. So uh, this, this is, uh, of course, one of uh, my favorite styles. Um, we as Dingemans are, are really very, very, very proud to, uh, to say that we are supplying to all of the Trappist uh, breweries in Belgium and in Holland. Um, I think in this way we are unique. We are, we are, um, we are, we are in a very good position. And um, we are very thankful to, to all of those uh, breweries. And we have a long lasting relationship with, with, um, with all of these beers. So um, to give you, for example, uh, on, on the Orval, before starting off on the malt types, um, Orval was, is, is one of my favorite beers. Um, there is one particular reason for that. Uh, there, there are two. One is that the taste is, is incredible. Um, very unique, unique taste, and, and a lot of brewmasters already try to copy uh, the taste, but unfortunately, the, the original one is, uh, is, is for me still the best one. So, um, and the second reason is that when I started here at the Malt House about 25 years ago, we, um, I was sent to, uh, to two uh, breweries. I was sent to Holland to uh, a Malt House, and I was sent to Orval, uh, because my uncle uh, knew very good the brewmaster there, Jean-Marie Rock. Um, and I was there for three months, uh, staying in the monastery in the week, coming out, coming to the to home in the weekend. So I lived a little bit uh, in, in, the, in the monastery in the week, and I ate with the monks. And, 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 and there's one small story that I could, I could give you, and maybe I already did tell this before, but the first evening when I was there at the monastery, there was a monk coming over with, with a key and he said, yeah, here, here you have the key. Uh, you, can, you can leave the monastery if you want uh, in the evening. And uh, the first evening I went out through this door and of course there is nothing. There are only woods around it. So you, you could leave. I was thinking a young guy, uh, 20, 20, 22 uh, years old to go out and to drink some beers, but no, this was not the case. Uh, you came out and you uh, saw only woods, woods, woods. So I did a lot of walking there. Um, but, but anyway, back to the beer. Um, maybe a lot of brewmasters don't know they also have the small beer, the small orval, the green orval, which you can only drink in the um, uh, Lange Gardien. Uh, this is the, the pub just next to the brewery. And um, once a year, I also go, of course, to visit uh, them. Uh, and it's, it's like a very nice valley where the, the abbey is located in. It's a very um, yellow stones. All the, the, the buildings are made of yellow stones. And if you just drive in the valley and you see the abbey, it's, it's a very, very, very beautiful place to go to. But um, maybe a little bit more on the, on the malt uh, types on the, of these uh, beers. Um, a lot of them, them are using um, caramelized malts. It's, it's one um, thing we see in, the, in their use of their, one second, one, um, it's, it's one thing we see that they use a lot of caramelized malts. And um, this, is, this is with all of the, these breweries. It, it, it depends if they are using Cara 8, Cara uh, 20, Cara 45, Special B. It depends for which beer. It depends uh, for, uh, for which brewery, but they are all are using a lot of caramelized malts. I'll come back to the explanation how we produce them uh, a little bit later. Um, maybe we could, we could just shift to, um, to some other uh, stories uh, around uh, these beers. Uh, for example, I, I just brought some some uh, some pictures, and um, this is, for example, uh, the the brew house of of Rochefort, which is called which is still completely in a, in a copper brew house. Uh, they are been building a new brew house, and I think it's operational since a few months. But the, this brew house is is longly called as one of the most beautiful brew houses in Belgium. Um, if you just see the setting, the church, uh, the brew house, uh, 
um, yeah, it's a very nice, uh, very nice setting. Um, the next picture I got with me, maybe I um, is is the a picture on the uh, just some, some just some stories to tell. Um, the next beer we will we will taste afterwards is the the Chimé uh, Grand Reserve, the Chimé Bleu, as we call it or they call it. Um, oh, there's a small story here. They have like a meeting room and uh, yearly uh, or, or twice a year, we, we, uh, we see, of course, our customers or more. And um, they have like a glass floor and underneath this glass floor, they have this cellar. And in this cellar, they keep uh, beers from, from many, many years, big bottles mostly. Uh, for example, you see here on the left side, you see beers from 2000. And it's just uh, a great place to go to and to see how they keep this beer uh, just as like a kind of, uh, how do you say it, a bibliotheque or a, a library, a library of beers. Um, just great. So this was just an intermezzo and now I'm coming back to my different malts. Um, so mostly used by, by different uh, Trappist breweries are uh, Cara 20, Cara 45, Special B. And um, how do we produce those malts? It's, um, we start steeping, we start with, and then afterwards germination. We will also do a very intense uh, germination to have as many uh, enzymes being formed, as many alpha, as many beta amylase being formed. And then we go in the wet phase as green malt. So uh, the malt just before kilning, we call green malt. Uh, so the green malt goes into the roasting drums. Um, one thing I need to highlight is that some maltsters tend that they can, but caramelized malts cannot be produced on a kiln. We produce aromatic, we produce aroma malt on the kiln up to, 50, uh, up to uh, 20 uh, lovey bond and, and, and 50 lovey bond on the kiln. But if you cut this, these grains, and you, you see inside, you only see uh, flour. You don't see sugar. So caramelized malts, because why, why is that so? Because um, we need to get in the roasting room, we will put uh, two or four tons of uh, green malt. And then the first step is about an hour it takes to get this, this, uh, this drum inside at 70 degrees, at uh, 160 Fahrenheit, the temperature of uh, alpha and beta amylase activity. And we do this by, by uh, heating around the drum and keeping the moisture inside. We, we don't want to take out the moisture because we need uh, an, an, uh, a wet surface. We need this, this uh, moisture to transfer the alpha, and to, to let the alpha and beta amylase work and to transfer the starch to sugar here at the moment. That's why we see, for example, that sacrification uh, for a Cara 20, Cara 45, Special B are around, of course, this is only a figure to give you an idea, around 75 to 85% sacrification. Uh, meaning if you cut a kernel, you will see almost the complete kernel, which is sacrificed. Um, after this hour of sacrification in the drum, we will start drying slowly. Uh, to a certain temperature, to a certain uh, um, end temperature, to a certain color. And it's due to this time that we choose or the, and the end temperature that we can make a differentiation between the Cara 20 and the Cara 45. Um, special B is something else. Special B is we, we start with, uh, I'm not gonna tell you the full, uh, the full uh, secrecy around it, but uh, Special B stands for Special Belgium. Special B stands for Special Bis. Um, special B is being double roasted. So we start first with a darker caramelized, production of a darker caramelized malt. It's been completely uh, cooled down. It's been stored in the silo. And afterwards it's going back into the drum for a second um, drying and, and, and roasting not, but the second heating up phase. And due to the second phase, we really get another taste, another aroma uh, of this malt, which makes this malt 
a very unique uh, mold. So when we go further to the back on the breweries, um, what else can I tell about this really very nice style? Um, maybe are we are we going to next, another beer, Ben? Or I, I have some story on uh, on on West Flater and, and on West Mall, uh, but maybe oh, oh, maybe maybe I should do the taste of the Orval first. Okay. Yeah, we we, we can talk that. about kind of general uh, flavor profiles here, and then we also have some questions that have come in in regards, and also one very uh outgoing comment and i'll tell you now uh jason lavery said special b is an amazing malt there is nothing that compares so just a a nod thank to you, you very all. much thank and you very much all the crew Great. activities so it's appreciated a lot thank you so orval the taste is quite unique it's um I don't know another beer that tastes like uh, Orval, to be honest. Um, you smell a lot of funkiness, some bread notes, but also some, some notes of the, the caramel malt. And um, if you taste it, it has a very light body. It's crisp with a gentle carbonation. Uh, you have the typical Orval taste that uh, comes from the, the house yeast in combination with the use of bread. And uh, also some hints of, uh, of roasted malts um, with a nice dry and bitter aftertaste. I really like it. it it's, it's one of my, my favorite Belgian Trappist beers. I have a quick question for you both. Uh, yes. Fresh Orval or aged Orval? I prefer aged uh, because it's it's more smooth. It's um, young Orval is is very oh, um, it's not round. Hey, you have a lot of, of different taste into it, but if you age Orval, you don't have to age too long. Um, one year is enough. It gets more smooth smoothiness into it, more more mouthfeel, more roundiness. Yeah, I, I like I like that. So I think there's time for both. I think there's time for a fresh Orval and a little bit older Orval. If you have really a very fresh Orval, it's there's nothing. It's it's amazing. It's amazing, and uh, and and an old an older Orval is also uh, appreciated. So I have I have both in my cellar. So I try to uh, to have both, and uh, that we have the choice to to drink what we uh, in which mood we are if we take a fresh or an older one. So which which are you drinking right now? Uh, this one. Question. This one was bottled the sixth of October. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, rather fresh. This one was bottled on my thirtieth birthday in April. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. <laughs> in April twenty twenty. Yeah. There you go. Okay. <laughs> um, there was a question about. Uh, the use of candy sugar and I from my understanding with candy sugar essentially it's used just to get the next step up for the alcohol right so proportionally um, if you want to raise your alcohol and make a, a stronger beer um, you would you would use up to 10 to 15 percent of Belgian candy sugar and that depends on if you want to use light or dark I know everybody kind of goes on their own path with that um, yeah. that's that's correct right it's it's been used, uh, yeah. It's been, it's it's clear. It's no secrecy. It's been used. Uh, it's been used uh, as for the color, as also for the to, to hire the alcohol. But the main color is coming from the malt, um, and 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 the dark candy sugar gives this extra color, and and because of most of those beers are also very sweet and very yeah. It's 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 a good combination specialty malt with this dark candy sugar. To achieve this final smoothness in the beer, um, there are some some uh, some uh, Trappist beers that are using some roasted malts, but but limited, uh, not exceeding zero five to one percent max. This is this is a general rule for for if you don't if you really don't want the the, the malty bitterness, which is. Of course, we have a debited black, and this is all improving this bit. Uh, this is all reducing this bitterness. But 
if you don't want if you don't exceed 0 0.5 to 1% you you are safe on on the on the multi bitterness from the roasted malt so um yeah we Excellent. That is it for questions on Trappist. I don't know, Carl, do you have anything else you want to add? Any more stories? I know that uh... um, we, we have, a, I have a, a, a small story on, on the West Flatern, um, uh, which is actually one of the breweries where there are still the monks brewing. Up till, up till now, uh, they have now somebody engaged, a layman, uh, I don't know if, the, it's, if it's the right word in English, but I googled it. Uh, a layman, is that the right word, uh, Dan? Uh, help me out. Uh, so somebody who is not in the Abbey. Yep. Um, and they, they hired somebody, but um, the, brew, the, the monks are still brewing at West Flatern. So this is meaning that I have uh, once, twice a year, uh, I go there and I, I, I talk with, with Father Rioris. Uh, who is the uh, responsible father for uh, the brewery. And uh, a few years ago, uh, I think it's already uh, almost 10 years ago, they had the consecration of the new bottling line at West Flatern. So um, this was the, the first and for me the only uh, consecration of a bottling line I ever had. And this was meaning that they really went out with, um, with, uh, with water and they uh, they had to um, to consecrate every uh, equipment of this uh, bottling line. It was a unique uh, afternoon, and they invited a few of their key suppliers and um, and some good friends and contacts for the brewery. And afterwards, of course, we had we were together in the in the Vrede, which I I imagine the brewmasters who are coming over to Belgium. Uh, trying to uh, to visit uh, West Flatern, which is unfortunately not, not possible, but they all go drinking a beer at, at the Vrede, which is the pub just on the other end of the street, owned by the monks. Uh, and it, it ended out by drinking a beer over there and uh, having um, an ice cream made on base of the West Flatern, and I forgot which one, but on based on the West Flatern. Uh, nice story, nice, nice uh, yeah, contact we have over there, and um, the last and 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 not um, not the, the the least of of the Trappist breweries is of course uh, West Mala, West Mala, who is uh, located only twenty kilometers away from here, so very nearby, and um, I have to tell you. If we're talking about West Mala, the favorite one is, is certainly the triple. I think on the triple beers, it is one of the best uh, triples you can find. Uh, it's very unique uh, taste, a very estuary taste, bananas, everything you can taste. I, I think it's a very wide range of, of uh, aroma and of taste you have there in this beer. And um, to give you a short example, uh, what the contact is and how long we are already working for, or we are working together with the monks there. Um, the third, and I am the fifth generation together with my brother, yeah. Uh, the third and the fourth generation, my uncle and my father and his uncle, um, they they went every Thursday, they went to the brewery as well to play with cards. They drank beer and they played cards every Thursday afternoon. And um, one of the thing was that they started with triple, but of course, after one or two triples, you, you uh, feel already uh, it's, it's quite heavy. So then afterwards they mixed extra, which is the extra is the lighter beer that they brew for the, for the monks themselves. It's, it's with the same yeast. It is actually, if uh, a brewmaster comes and visits us here in Belgium, it's one of the beers we, we serve here at the, at the malt house. Um, and they made a mix uh, extra with triple and uh, just to balance it a little bit and to, to lower the alcohol a little bit after playing for two or three hours with cards. So um, yeah, with, with all these Trappist breweries, we have really have a, a very good connection and we try to work with them uh, as best as we can. Uh, maybe uh, a final story on the, on the Rochefort is that we, we got a, a phone call a few uh, months ago, like nine or 10 months ago, on their, uh, they wanted to order a special malt and uh, which was normally not used by them. 
and they asked me to uh, to keep my mouth shut and to tell nothing in the industry because they were creating a new beer, which now maybe already in the US they know uh, there is a triple from Rochefort. four. Um, I, I think you already know, and 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 so also for with this we are being contacted and we are in, in good contact with them. So, so is that Rochefort nine then? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> what is that? Is it Rochefort 9 then? Is it, it's got to be between uh, 8 and 10. No, right? no, it's called uh, Rochefort Extra. Triple oh, extra. triple extra. Yeah. It's a Rochefort triple. Yeah. It's it's the first triple of Rochefort. Rochefort till now only had dark beers, the 6, the 8, and the 10. And now they are, uh, since, since a few weeks, uh, maybe two months, they have a, a triple. Uh, it's on the market, but it's not easy to find. Um, but I haven't tasted it yet, uh, but I presume I will have uh, one in a few weeks. <laughs> Eight is one of my favorites. I, or two. I, I, Giovanni yeah. also wants one, so uh, yeah. Yeah. It was already completely sold out after two weeks. <laughs> All the shops, everyone was rushing to the store. Oh, we want to try that triple. Now it's gone everywhere, so um, yeah. they need to produce more. All um, right. Well, we need to keep moving. We uh, we definitely were going to spend a little time on the Trappist because we had three of them to go over um, and sample. But what do you say we move on to the uh, triple quad section? Yeah. Great for us. So the last beer we have is the Golden Drock. It is the classic. So everybody might have a different version, but... Uh, we've got, I have the classic over here, which the brewery describes as a dark triple. And under the BJCP guidelines in the U.S., it kind of could hit a few categories as to what it is. So I think for the purpose of this, we're discussing quad or Belgian dark strong. Um, but they are typically very high in alcohol, up towards the 10.5% range on this particular beer. And there are some deep malt flavors of caramel, roasted malt, and slight coffee. Um, Delicious beers and dangerously drinkable, but uh, gonna go ahead and pass this over to Carl to uh, discuss the proper malt bill for something uh, to be produced in the style. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Indeed, uh, a heavy style to end up with. Um, a nice style, uh, Brauerei, uh, Bra uh, Brewery uh, Van Steenbergen, producing Gilden Drag. Um, what, what malt type we want to highlight here is clearly uh, the darker uh, color we are achieving uh, with, with uh, chocolate malt and with the bitter black malt. Um, going up to 340 to 530 lover bond and uh, used quite often, of course, in this, in this uh, Belgian style in combination with other malts, of course, uh, with, with uh, pale ale malts, with, with Munich malts, uh, depending on which brewery and also with some caramelized malts. But to add and to finalize at, at this higher color, uh, quite often uh, chocolate malt and the bitter black malt are used. Um, on, the, on the production side of these malts, um, what can we say about that? So we start with a, a normal classic Pilsen malt. I mean, we are not producing chocolate malt and the bitter black malt from some not okay Pilsen malt. No, we are using the, the, the same standards as for our normal Pilsen malt as base. So we firstly produce a Pilsen malt, uh, steeping germination kilning. After kilning, we uh, take off the husks, uh, we take off the, the germs and uh, malt germs. And then when it's cleaned, afterwards we, we uh, start roasting. Um, so we have a, a second a drying step, a second uh, roasting step, and uh, for the chocolate malt, we more go over up to 425 to 400 to 430 uh, Fahrenheit, and uh, for the deep bitter black, we we uh, go up to 455 to 460 uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, knowing that the inflammable temperature of uh, malt is around 465 to 470 Fahrenheit, 
we are certainly with the black malt, we are very close to the inflammable point, um, which makes roasting a, um, yeah, let's, let's call it a dangerous, not a hobby, but a dangerous uh, side on our, uh, on our business. Um, but the last years, we really invested a lot in keeping this on the safe side. Um, what's so typical on our roasting sheet? So uh, we start off with uh, temperatures of uh, 50 degrees, and then we, over the, the time of two hours, where a caramel production malt is taking about three hours, uh, roasting uh, uh, schedule is about two hours, two hours and a half, depending on which type we produce. And what's so typical and how do we produce this? Um, to, be, to achieve this debittered black malt, we are going to do and to add at certain times during the process, we are going to add extra uh, water, uh, which of, of course directly evaporates and creates steam into the roaster. And due to this steam, uh, quite a lot of bitterness is being uh, evaporated and is being uh, absorbed. So uh, what this we do uh, three times at three different temperatures. We add this water and the, and the steam to, uh, to really soften out the, um, the taste and to lower uh, the bitterness. Um, what else can I say about this malt? Uh, it's it's uh, in this range of malts, on the roasted malts, we also have a biscuit malt, which is a very light uh, malt, also being roasted, but I prefer to call it toasted because it's really very soft. It's uh, biscuit malt is actually produced from uh, finished Pilsen malt and then slightly toasted up to a much lower temperature, of course, of around 300 uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, going only to a color of around uh, 20, 25 max uh, love bond. And now I give the word uh, back to Giovanni uh, on this beautiful style. So um, the Gulden Drag is a bit of a, an outliner uh, because when you see it, it's quite light, of course. Other Belgian cloths are more darker um than this one uh for example the saint bernard's 12 uh, 12 so that's the belgian quad version which one we tried uh, the white before uh, also the strava hendrik is a as a large uh, a very dark color um so when you smell at the beer all belgian quads they smell they have a lot of caramel in the nose, some molasses, uh, some burnt sugar, uh, some cocoa, uh, and, and rosiness. Now, the rosiness is, is less uh, available uh, with this uh, with this golden drag. Uh, it's more sweeter. It's, it's more like a sweet quadruple. Um, and when you taste it, it, it has a, a deep, rich flavor um, with lots of dark fruit. Uh, some dates, uh, plums, toffee, um, but also some some rosiness coming from uh, from the chocolate malt and the debitter black. Um, with hints, subtle hints in this one of chocolate, cocoa, um, and a, a good mouthfeel uh, with a deep, warm aftertaste, a very alcoholic, alcoholic aftertaste. I did want to note something too, and I think that's very important. And being an American and starting my career in this industry is in the brew house. I think that when I came into this, my perception is that, you know, you use your any European malt, domestic, whatever, uh, to produce Belgian beer. And when, then when you really look into it and you start going through the list of beers that we've talked about today that are utilizing Dingemans, if you want to replicate the style and pay homage to those that have paved the way, then look no further because Dingamins is your answer. So just want to say cheers <laughs> to you guys. I mean, it's really amazing when we started looking through the portfolio of brewers that you work with. Cheers. Uh, cheers. When I found out we were carrying you guys, I jumped for joy. <laughs> I was so happy. So okay. uh, cheers to you guys. Yeah, this is this has been really, really cool. And I do appreciate you guys. Uh, Thanks a lot, Ben. Yeah. It's appreciated a lot. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, we have a we have a couple of fun questions here at the end that okay aren't extremely related to um, these beers in particular. Mm -hmm. One of them, um, Dan Ross asks, I know this is probably blasphemy, but what are your favorite styles of American beers that Dingamans is used in? The favorite style of American beers? Yes, yeah. So something that's brewed in America that's not traditionally um, a Belgian style beer is what I'm thinking that he's asking. That's a good question. American styles. Um, yeah, of course. American style, but um, some of the, the Boulevard beers, some uh, some rye malt in, uh, in some New England IPAs. Um, yeah, there is many options. There's many options. Yeah, I, I know uh, one of my favorites was a uh, Saison by Surly Brewing Company that uh, Todd Howe worked with. Surly you. Is, 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 is a good customer from us. Yeah, for sure. Yep. We also have a long lasting history with, uh, with Boulevard, it's actually of course. The glass I'm using right now. Ah, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, using a, I'm using this one. I'm not sure where the camera is. I'm using West Mall. Um, yeah, there, there are many... Uh, Quite many breweries using our malt, also in the U.S. Um, bigger ones, smaller ones, Boom Island, uh, small yeah. and big breweries. So uh, we have a very nice contact with uh, with our American breweries. And unluckily, for the first year we are now together with BSG, there was no CBC. So uh, let's hope we can catch up uh, next year if, due to Corona, we are able to come over. Let's hope oh. for that. Hey, Carl, really quick, I wanted to, to ask one more question of you. Um, being that we didn't cover this specific style, which is also one of my favorites, uh, which Lambic breweries do you work with? Do you have some time, Ben? <laughs> I have a ton of time. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I, I think you know Drifontaine. I, uh, I think you know um, Girardin, uh, Frank Boone, uh, Lindemans, Leafmans, um, Timmermans, uh, I think, uh, Albersel, uh, I think we supply uh, most of them, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, Cantillon, course, with right? Cantillon is 100% yeah. uh, Digimons. Yeah, sorry, I forgot. Uh, yeah, there's so many. I mean, uh, Jean, so, so Jean, you from, the, Jean from the shoulder off, you know, <laughs> it's pretty. Yeah, Jean from awesome. Cantillon uh, is a nice guy, and uh, we. We, 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 we see each other uh, yeah, once a year or we, 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 we see each other on uh, events and uh, yeah, very nice. I did a, a couple brew days with Jean and got to mash out for him there. So I'm proudly brewed with Dingamans uh, in okay. Belgium. And uh, if you see him again, tell him that that ratty kid from uh, California says hi. <laughs> so. Okay, great. <laughs> So just a, a general question, um, two of them from Jason Lavery. Do you host visiting brewers? And also this might be a question for Carl and your brother. Um, is there a sixth generation of Dingamans in the wings? Um, to answer this first question, we, we do host brewers. It's not, um, we work, we are a company with, with 40 people. So we work also in the maltings. I mean, it's not like we are somewhere sitting around and doing nothing. So, I mean, um, we host brewers. Uh, we, we welcome brewers to come over, um, to go and visit in the malt house, to drink a beer together one day, one afternoon, uh, but not the whole week. <laughs> so, uh, but we really welcome brewers. And then if you come over and you are in Belgium, Please let us know through BSG or, or direct. Um, we are always open to, to host you when you come over. And we can also uh, help you out with some, some, nice, um, some nice pubs or some nice brewery tours you can, you can uh, do here in Belgium. We can all help you with that, organize that. And there is indeed a second, uh, a sixth generation. Uh, my children are uh, 18 and 19, so they're still, um, they're going to, to university and my brother's children are, are, are much younger they are between uh, eight and then and, and 15 
So uh, sixth generation is on the road, but uh, please, I'm only 46, so uh, <laughs> there's no issue there. <laughs> Well, they won't get me out. They won't get me out that easily. <laughs> if you do go visit, you got to bring them beer too. Everyone from the U.S. Of course. If you yeah. come over, the, the least you can do is bring some beers with you. <laughs> right. Yeah, and we ask that anybody who is traveling to any of our suppliers, including Dingamens, that they contact our sales managers or anyone at BSG, and we'll get you in touch with whomever really? you should talk to. When yeah. you're out there and it, it's sure to always be a good time and a very good learning experience so yeah we're happy to accommodate that uh giovanni and i are, are happy to do that sure so well um we have one more question that i'm going to get to um it's obviously something that all of us are experiencing across the globe but has the pandemic influenced the barley harvest and the maltery this year so have you guys seen any you know, situation, it's probably better over in Belgium because every place I think is better than the United States right now. But, um, you know, yeah. has it hurt you guys in any way or influenced, you know, changing how you do business? Of course, of course. I think it has influenced the whole, uh, the whole sector. And um, up to now, uh, we had to reduce capacity during, during this year. Uh, I think everybody has done that in the malting industry. We um, we are been working a little bit longer with old crop, which doesn't mean that the quality of this malt isn't that good. Um, barley can easily be held if it's well stored more than a year or almost two years. No, no issue there. So, yeah, it was a challenging year, and um, let's let's all hope that. We, we can enjoy a little bit the, the Christmas and the, the, new, year, the new Year's um, holidays um, here in the U.S. And that uh, we, can we can easily forget 2020 and move over to 2021 being a, a non-COVID, hopefully a non-COVID year. But I'm a little bit afraid. Uh, but I try to be optimistic and uh, let's hope we move over to a, a good 2021 That's in the near future. That's all we can do is be positive and hope we can all enjoy a beer in the presence yeah. of each other's company again. So let's cheers to that. Yes. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. We do have one more question, Carl, and it's uh, what is your favorite beer? That's uh, we can get you in trouble, of course, is what they said. But uh, what's your overall favorite beer style? If, if you can't answer that. Um. I must say, um, I think Orval is on the number one and uh, Triple West Mall is the number two. And the number three, I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> maybe, maybe the number three, maybe the number three is this one. I don't know. We, we got a, a, a very nice glass from, uh, from Rochefort when we visited them uh, uh, a year or two ago. Uh, maybe this one, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to fill that for us and drink the whole time. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not sure how many liters that is, but I think three. Three liters? No, okay. four maybe. We'll, we'll, uh, it's, it's good enough with all the styles for today. Yeah. You know, we, we'd like you to get home safely after this. So <laughs> thanks, then. Thanks. You're, you're welcome. Well, hey, thank you guys, Carl, Giovanni, Ben. Greatly appreciate you guys taking the time today. Uh, once we finish up here, I'll reach out to our Q&A swag, swag pack winner. So check your yeah. inbox and I will, Carl will be in touch about that uh, West Vletteran. Yeah, we have some bottles here. So uh, yeah. yeah, we'll send them over. We'll send For them sure. over. So a lot of great, great questions today. Thanks everyone. Um, if we didn't get to your questions, please send them to webinars at bsgcraft.com. We'll work with Carl, Giovanni, or Ben to get you some answers. So um, remember, keep an eye out for new episodes. We announce those through our newsletter and social media channels. Also, for any past webinars, please visit YouTube and search BSG Craft and uh, feel free to subscribe. So from all of us at BSG, Dingamans, thanks for tuning in. I'm Dan Carney, and we'll see you around. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Stay safe.